thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope you were able to attend some of the other sessions earlier today in the school garden workshop um, that we had. Um, we had composting, vermiculture. Um, we talked. We've talked about pollinators and bugs and um, incorporating Florida-friendly landscaping principles in with your edible gardens. Um, so it's been. Uh, I've had a good day today with you, and I hope you have as well. And then, of course, I can't forget show and tell because. I love hearing directly from the teachers and, and hearing their stories. So, um, so today we're just going to go ahead and, and dig in and forgive me because I may go out of order. Um, so let's see here. So our objective is basically I'd like to explain to you a little bit of how our program works in Sarasota. And I do understand that our program may operate differently than it does in other areas of the state. Um, uh, but we do have some folks that are local and, and would like to know um, uh, the timing and what resources are available. Um, and then things to consider if you're starting a garden. Um, so those site considerations, um, considerations on whether or not you're ready to expand your garden. Um, and then also who should be on your team? Uh, where do you go to find curriculum? That type of thing. So when considering starting a garden um, and also identifying some of the challenges that teachers have. So it helps you kind of understand the teacher perspective if you're looking to volunteer with a school garden and see how you can uh, best assist. Teacher challenges a lot of time is lack of time uh, for, for one thing. Um, also, Oh, PDF files available for viewing later on. Yes, um, hopefully, if the PDF isn't too, if it, if it isn't too big, we, um, I am recording, uh, but I also will have like a resource page that I want to um, send out to you as well. And I'm hoping to build time mostly in here where we have a little bit of time for folks to kind of um, click on some links um, that we've talked about either in earlier classes or in this one. Um, so you have a little bit of time built in this session to, to kind of see, um, get your feet wet exploring some of the online uh, refer references that have been um, given. So teacher challenges are uh, generally speaking are gonna be lack of time, uh, lack of experience. Um, if you did get an opportunity to hear our teacher speakers earlier today, um, you know, as they said, um, sometimes they were stepping into it without having any gardening experience. So they're trying to learn how to garden on top of um, all the other things that they need to know to teach their students. Um, so having uh, folks like Master Gardener volunteers, um, extension resources, people who are a little more comfortable with gardening um, is a really good, um, it's a good resource uh, for teachers to be able to pull on. Um, I would say one of the things that's going to be like the when I've had the misfortune to hear of a garden closing, it's usually because there was lack of support from it or understanding from the administration side. So um, for whatever reason, the, the students, the teachers, the administration, they couldn't come together and fully see the value and the use of the space. Um, and so then if it kind of uh, lingered on like that for a little bit, um, sometimes they find another use for that space. Um, so it is good to kind of try to stay connected in with your leadership, make sure that you have um, their go ahead before putting in a garden um, and then find ways to, to share the value of what you're doing. So then that way um, they stay involved and supportive. So with all those challenges on that page, why a school garden? Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of feedback of some of the teachers and volunteers who participated with our programming, some of their feedback. And basically you're making a physical space, you're making a space for sharing knowledge because um, it really is an outdoor classroom. Uh, so you'll hear parents love that the kids are, so these are quotes from um, teachers and volunteers and they love that their kids are eating more vegetables, um, that the kids are learning how the food gets to their table and that they get to be outside in a learning lab. Um, that they, one of the teachers um, when COVID hit and she was teaching virtually, a lot of the kids that couldn't be in the school gardening anymore actually started gardening at home and then started sharing those teachers, uh, those pictures with their teacher of how they were gardening at home, which is um, really heartwarming. Um, and then 
growing gardeners. And I love the one, um, I think this was one of our master gardeners that they talked about how kids were learning to become stewards of the land. Um, and I don't know that we could ask for much more than that. So, um, so to keep it really simple, some garden elements, you need a place to plant, you need some plants and you need some people. Um, and that's a very uh, basic nutshell. And so extension can assist sometimes with coming out and helping you evaluate your space. Um, if you're in a place where maybe for some reason they are unable to come to you and assist you with the site selection, you may be able to send in pictures um, that can help them assist you with saying, yes, this looks like a good spot, or maybe this is problematic. Have you considered over here? I would say if you're going to have like a master gardener or extension agent or someone come out and help you select that site, it's good to kind of walk your campus um, and consider two or three locations that you'd like to have a garden. Um, and, and also, of course, engage with your administration. They may have thoughts of, of where it should or shouldn't go. Um, so in our, um, where we are here in Sarasota, our extension office, um, we're fortunate that we're able to provide um, seedlings and seeds to the school gardens. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview how that, how that works here. Um, and then with connecting people. So uh, if no one is using the garden, it's basically like a beautification project. Um, and so you do wanna have uh, people involved. So these are really great guides, um, whether you're you wanting to start a garden or you have an existing garden and you're looking for additional resources of trying to identify who should be on your team. Maybe you're looking to see, um, you feel like there's a gap somewhere and you don't know exactly where that gap is and, and what resource you're looking for. Um, these are two really great free resources. So I'm gonna see if I can pop it open. In a, so Wilma, can you give me a nod? Are you seeing the school garden guide pop up? Great. So um, this is starting and sustaining a school garden in Florida. Um, and this is wonderful in that Florida is a little different than some of the other states where our planting calendars are different. So it's great when you can find the Florida resources. This basically walks you all the way through of how to build your team, what kind of talents you might be looking for, um, ways to generate interest with things like a whisper campaign, um, how to um, dig deeper and find other resources, um, how to communicate your vision, build up your team. It's great to identify your goals. What is the purpose of your space? Are you looking to grow edibles? Are you looking to grow pollinator plants? Um, are you, is it going to be solely for a singular classroom or is it going to be, are you trying to launch something for the whole entire school? Um, I would say sometimes it's easier to start small and expand. Um, but having those goals, understanding what you're going to be using the space for, um, really helps keep the, the everybody on the same page and moving forward. So even if there's a, a little bit of a disagreement here or there on how you're going to get there, um, if you have that common uh, vision, that's very helpful. So there's ideas about fundraising in here things that you would need to actually do to create your garden? And then how would you go about maintaining it and keeping it going on into perpetuity? So if you had an opportunity to hear from our teachers earlier today, inevitably sometimes teachers are reassigned what they're teaching. Um, so how often they can engage with a school garden can, can vary, or maybe they retire. And so what happens to that school garden? Um, so this can help you review all those types of things. And then let me go ahead and get back into. And then this guide, the Grow to Learn guide, is hands down most everyone that gets a chance to review it um, loves the Grow to Learn guide. Uh, and I kind of suggest it to people, even if they're gardening um, edibles and they're not gardening with you. It's such a nice orientation to gardening in Florida, and it's really comprehensive, and it's not, it's, it's not outdated yet, um, and it's free. And this is a long PDF. It's like 112 pages, um, but you can see through here, it is going to walk you through getting started, the boots on the ground, sustaining the garden, expanding your garden, 
So you're kind of seeing common things. So if this is 112 pages, we're not going to get through all that material in a single hour, but I wanted to make sure you knew where the information was. Um, do not skip the appendix in this book um, because there's lots of great resources in the appendix. But this book actually goes through different types of methods of growing. Um, how would you determine if it's suitable for your space? Um, how you grow your team? Um, I think the only thing that may have changed on here is some of the grant links. Sometimes grants go away. Um, and so some of those links might not work anymore. But there's even a page in here for um, curriculum links. So you can see, let's see here. Oh, sorry about that. So it, I, I tapped something. So it opened the screen for like Junior Master Gardener as a curriculum um, out of Texas. And, um, and they have connected to a lot with the really neat thing is a lot of the curriculum ties to standards um, and they'll reference it. So it's a really great way of connecting with what you're doing. Um, yes, uh, so I'm just looking through the chat real quick. Um, yes, so we're talking about parents getting involved in the gardening program. Parents can be an excellent resource because sometimes you need help with your irrigation. Sometimes you need help with building a, a raised bed, um, different things, and or just having extra hands to be involved. Um, so if you can let them know what you're trying to do, um, usually you'll get a, a bite from at least one of the parents. Um, and then yes, the, the family nutrition program is really, um, really helpful. And I do have a video from our local food system specialist with a family nutrition program. So that Grow to Learn uh, school gardening guide is really helpful. I didn't scroll all the way through, but you can see how it had multiple topics. And then in the appendix, it has in there um, about the planting calendar and all sorts of things. So our local program, we're, we're really fortunate in Florida that our calendar, like our planning, like our planting calendar, harvest, all of that, it ties really well with our school garden year. So um, that is one of the benefits of, of being in Florida. It's easy to tailor um, how we support the schools with how things grow in Florida. Um, so some folks up north, um, they're getting into growing and then all of a sudden schools closed for summer. Um, here, right when it's getting really hot and uncomfortable, you can put your, your garden to bed, um, enjoy your summer off, and then uh, come back to the school and, and, and start all over again. So we do provide um, some plants uh, in the fall, usually late September, early October. Uh, and we try to do plants that will harvest in a like, lesser number of days. So like preferably somewhere in that like 40 to 75 day kind of a window. Um, we try to get it something that you can hopefully harvest before the holiday break, but sometimes um, it is coming in right after that. So, and then you'll be harvesting some crops, like some of the peppers and the tomatoes, if they're doing well, you just pull them over. Um, and then plant again in February, and then and harvest again April, May, depending on the school needs because of things like testing. So, um, and then we planted a little bit later this past year um, because we had some impacts from COVID and we wanted teachers to have a chance to kind of orient to um, the changes in their routines. Um, so they had okra and stuff like that and some sunflowers they probably still need to pull before they put the gardens to bed. So along with the plants, um, so when you're looking at this, the harvest, so if some of those materials, the teachers or the volunteer come and, and pick up those plant materials and seeds. Um, and then prior to COVID, we used to go out and do some planting assistance at some of these sites. And then we do have some schools where a master gardener had developed a relationship over time and done regular education with, um, with some of the students in some of the classes. Um, so they would just kind of incorporate and use some of our schedule. Uh, and then harvest lessons, the family nutrition program, if the school qualifies, they do a really wonderful job with those harvest lessons. And then for some of the sites that don't qualify, qualify for that program, 
our family consumer science agent and I would go out and do a harvest lesson. And harvest lessons, so it can be, you can keep it as simple as you'd like to. Um, hopefully you heard some of the teacher ideas earlier when they were talking about like stone soup and, and things of that nature. Um, and then, but we've gone out and if you're looking to get kids to try a vegetable um, fresh and you don't have a lot of time to get fancy and um, you can make healthy dips uh, and then whatever vegetable that you can eat fresh from the garden um, is something they can try uh, dipping. Um, and you can talk about the nutrients that are in the vegetables that they're harvesting. So we provide information about the plants that, that we're giving them. So this is just kind of a checklist of some of the materials that would be in their packet when they were, then when they were receiving the plants. So even though there was COVID and fewer of the schools planted, the teachers did a really phenomenal job. Like fall, over 32 sites still planted a school garden. Um, and that could be either at a school site, a pre-K site, uh, after school site. Um, and then in spring, we had over 27 that planted a spring garden. So, which I think was phenomenal. Um, in our district, a lot of the teachers were teaching um, in person and virtually. So also having a school garden, you could imagine would keep them quite busy. So um, it was phenomenal. So many were, were still willing to um, participate and provide that space for their students. So on this, it just kind of gives the teacher a little bit of, li of a list of like what plants we're giving them because some plants look like other plants. So hopefully by giving them a little bit of a count um, when they're looking at their tray, um, it helps out. And then we give them some information about those plants. Um, one of the things I've learned is when giving seedlings, try to give a picture of what it looks like now, not what it looks like uh, two months from now. So that way, if they're trying to figure out what plant it is, if they're planting independently, um, they have something to pull it up to for comparison. So this basically gave a little bit of information about the plants, um, a little bit of how to plant it and how they would go about harvesting it. Um, and then, so there were usually a couple more pages that also included information about the seeds. So there's a lovely master gardener that helps by giving a template. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Kemble, the chart was helpful. So, um, here you have plants in your hands and a garden and, and a bunch of kids and where do the plants go? So usually there's a little bit of um, like an inertia of a panic. Um, I felt it myself. When you have these plants, you, have, you wanna get this done, but you don't know what should go where. Um, and so there's a wonderful master gardener named Arnie. And, um, and so the past few seasons, he's done a, like a, a template, a mock layout, if you will, on if he was planting, here's some of where he would put those plants. Um, the teachers are not required to follow this. This is just to basically give them an idea of where they may want to put their plants and where we think they would do well um, in their beds. I do not track where all the teachers plant their plants. So I'm not, um, I don't have the capacity to suggest to them in their individual garden, how they should rotate their crops or anything of that nature. Um, and the reason they get a template, it's basically four of roughly four by four beds um, that, and then if they had more beds than this, they could just try to duplicate if I can provide enough plants and seeds. And then, so this was basically, the reason you're seeing that as the mock layout is because, and one of the reasons Sarasota has as many school gardens as it does, was um, there was like a, a template that was developed of a, a simple way of installing a school garden. Um, and it was basically four beds of four by four. And uh, the raised beds are the kind that you just connect together like Lincoln logs. You don't have to have any tools um, or anything of that nature. Um, so they went in relatively easily. And then some of the gardens, um, if you were in uh, our earlier sessions, you heard how some of the gardens have expanded over the years with things like plants. So I do want to, um, someone had already mentioned in the chat, our partnership with the Family Nutrition Program. Um, and they're also UF affiliated. 
Um, they can't support every school garden. Um, they do have parameters and I'm gonna have, um, hopefully you'll hear Emily Grant, who is our local food system specialist, explain a little bit more of how she can partner for school gardens. Um, well, no, once I hit play, if you can not, if you hear it. Hello, everyone. I wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. I know that uh, a few of you I've been in touch with via email or possibly on the phone over this past year during the pandemic. But some of you I have not had a chance to um, talk to yet. And many of you, if not most of you, I haven't had a chance to meet in person. So I wanted to say hello. I am Emily Grant I'm with the um, UF IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program. And uh, I am the food system specialist as well as the public health specialist for Sarasota County, as well as three other counties in our area. So my primary role um, in Sarasota County has done a lot with supporting gardens. So a little bit more in the background, but I work with many fairly closely and we work on supporting school gardens. So the Family Nutrition Program provides uh, nutrition education to schools, as well as what we call policy system and environment work. So adding the additional piece of the nutrition education, and in this case with gardens, to really see where our food comes from, how things are grown. And the schools that we are able to support are either Title I schools or schools where there is a large population of students on free or reduced lunch. Um, that 50% of the student population qualifies for SNAP. And SNAP is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, previously known as food stamps. So any school site that qualifies, we're able to provide things like seeds and transplants, soil, vermicompost, gloves, you name it, things that you're going to need for your garden to get started. So many of you, um, I had a chance to communicate with the Mail um, or on the phone it was last year and uh, wanted to get a chance to say hello today. So while we are together, I thought it would be fun to share a couple of photos. <laughs> and um, here is a photograph of me volunteering at Sug Middle School, which has a um, an urban ag program. And this is in uh, Manatee County, uh, but wanted to, to show you out there. It was, it was very hot um, getting the garden down uh, for and ready for time. Um, and here is my very first pineapple. Let's see. Here is my very first pineapple. Uh, so I grew this, uh, took a couple years, and I was very proud of it. Um, so this was just ripe last year. And uh, last but not least, uh, here's a picture of my own garden. So I garden at the Bayou Oaks Community Garden and have had a couple plots this past year, just had my, my kind of one main one and wanted to share that with you. So um, I look forward to supporting you all this fall with your garden and uh, providing nutrition education with my team. And if you would like to reach out to me, my number is 941-254-1967 or it's emily.grant at ufl.edu. So, um, it's really lovely to get a chance to see you, even if it's virtual, and I look forward to um, being in touch again soon. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, Emily's been uh, partnering and supporting the school gardens that, um, that qualify for Family Nutrition Program. I know, know she's been uh, wishing for opportunity to be able to say hi face-to-face, uh, -face, so um, I was happy she could She's in, um, I think they're doing statewide family nutrition program training uh, right now. So she wasn't able to join us directly. So, but she was kind enough to send the message. Let's see here. And um, so we were talking a little bit about the, the template and how a lot of the garden started. And if you were to consider, so say you have no garden um, or you have a garden and you're looking for an additional place to put one uh, or expand into, you want at least six hours of sunlight a day. Um, you don't have to have that in your whole entire space, but most of your vegetables would like at least six hours of sun. 
Um, and then just bearing in mind that I believe the sun is in our southern sky in the winter months. Um, so uh, where you get light now may not be exactly where you would get light um, from fall through spring. And believe, believe it or not, there's little, um, what would you call it, like sun measure, sunlight measuring calculator things that you can put in if you needed to. Um, otherwise, just go out a few different times of the day and, and um, uh, do some observation. You need a water, a water source, and then um, it needs to be easily accessible. So one of the things that I've seen in gardens that are being underutilized is because they are too far from the kids and the teachers. So uh, teachers only have so much time in a day. And so if they're spending how much of the time just trying to navigate to the garden, uh, especially when you start getting into things like middle school and high school where you have um, uh, confined uh, class periods, um, inevitably it's harder for people to use that space. So placement's important. You want it to be in an area where people aren't going to tramp through it all day long, and, um, but you do want to have it easily accessible. And then um, again, administrative support. Um, you, you should if you're starting a garden um, or expanding a garden, uh, you should have more than just yourself um, involved. Um, just because you, at some point you might want a vacation um, and you need to have uh, some backup. So, and the other things that you can consider is like, how are you gonna go about scheduling that maintenance? Who's like, visualize who's going to be doing this. And then that way you understand if you're ready to get started with actually implementing uh, a garden space. And you can have the students pair and partner in some of the, this brainstorming. So the template we were talking about is like four beds of four by four. Nowadays, they measure closer to about 42 inches. Um, we were using beds by Greenland Gardener. Uh, they were very economical. They were usually about six inches high. Um, now you can get them in eight inches high. The major con right now is they're out of stock. Um, and um, so, but anything, you know, somewhat similar, uh, the reason we really like using them, as you can see in that picture, um, it, you basically like Lincoln Logs. You just um, put them together, then you don't have to have any tools whatsoever. So very easy. Um, the only thing is after a while they do bow out, but it takes years. Um, and they, did, they do hold up better than um, untreated lumber. Um, so you don't have to go this route. This is just one that, um, that worked well for our programming. You can, Extension loves to share resources. So there's, um, there's more than one um, resource online through Extension that tells you how to go about building a raised bed, what kind of materials you could consider for building a raised bed um, and things of that nature. So if you were to do, um, if you were to build raised beds or, or buy pre-purchase, um, some of the things that should be on your shopping list, um, whether it's weed barrier or cardboard um, for some weed suppression, it is not going to suppress weeds for eternity. It's just to buy you some time uh, so that you can start growing other things and, and get that maintenance going. Um, some mulch for paths, um, raised beds or material to build the beds. Um, you don't have to go raised beds, but in ground isn't common with the school gardens. Um, they're, People usually like to have some definition to that space of the garden. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, self-watering containers in a minute. So you can buy mix already made, or you can create your own mix. Um, you do need something that will, that will drain. Um, and then things for mulching the beds, uh, which may not be the same material as what you mulched the path with. Um, hose. Nozzle, so you can control the, full, the flow of the water. You don't want something that's going to come out in high velocity that's going to basically unplant everything you planted. Um, tools and a place to store them. So if it's a very small space, it might be something as simple as a tote that you carry out with you. I personally find it easier if the tools are out where you're going to. So like it might be a, a storage bench um, that has, uh, that's for outdoor use. Um, or like a deck box. And that also doubles as some seating. So if you have some kiddos that can't stand for a duration um, or if you need somewhere to set something, um, those are handy. If you're gonna get, um, if you're gonna have 
many, many beds, you're going to either need multiple of that, or you may end up getting into that stage where you need additional storage. Um, you need plant seeds, stir sticks for labels or other, other things that are similar. Um, to the right, it's from the, um, the Grow to Learn guide, but it's the mix of um, what's used a lot in square foot gardening and raised beds. Um, so you can do exactly that, or you can do similar. I know some folks don't like to use, use peat moss, and instead they like to use like coconut core and things like that. Um, so self-watering containers, um, a lot of folks are starting to go in this direction when they're first starting out. Um, they're, they're nice because they're portable. If you didn't like them in the spot you put them, you pick them up and move them. Um, you don't have to uh, have a hose always nearby because you're just filling that reservoir and then refilling the reservoir. Um, so they're, they're versatile. Um, you're not going to grow as much in that space as you would in a four by four, um, but it is a little bit deeper than some of the, those beds. So you have some versatility. Um, and then you can make your own grow bucket. Grow buckets. So self-watering containers, a lot of times we call them earth boxes, but that's actually a brand name. Um, another kind is like city pickers, which is in the picture. Um, and then you can make your own. So in the back of that grow to learn guide, when I said not to skip the appendix, there's actually instructions on how to go about making your own grow buckets. So you, do, you would need somebody handy. I know I don't have some of those dr drill implements um, on, my, on my own. Um, but I probably know a master gardener or a parent that could that could do it. Um, you you do want to pay attention to the grade of the plastic um, if you're going to put be putting them outside in Florida heat. Um, some of the is going to hold up better and is better for um, growing food. So some of the resources uh, to learn a little bit more of raised bed gardening or gardening in some of those self watering containers. The square foot gardening book that's been out for decades now. Um, and then uh, there's Earthbox actually has on their website. Um, one of the things I've noticed, whether it's a seed company um, or, um, or something like Earthbox, a lot of the really useful links on educational information for some reason is at the bottom. So scroll down. Um, same thing for our website. Sometimes some of the best links are at the bottom. So you can see there's actually a, like a mock layout depending on what it is that you'd be interested in planting. So you can see how many of those plants you'd be able to put in that earth box um, or, or city picker, any self-watering container that you're interested in. Um, and this is just a little clip showing you some of the additional material they put on their website. And then um, the square foot gardening guide is helpful. And then there is a gentleman, an extension agent out of... Orange County. And so he talks all about square foot gardening. Um, and so he goes on quite a bit on helping you identify the site, what kind of material you would you would consider, um, the mix. So if you don't want to go out and buy the book or find it in the library, um, you can actually glean a lot of information right from this blog. See, it goes on for quite a bit. Um, lots of good information in there. So, and that ultimately that's our, our goal with extension is to provide you with tools and resources. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to find some of that. So, sorry for our, all the words. Um, so basically, say you have a limited space, but you're looking for more ways to incorporate more people in that space. Um, you can rotate it. So one of the elementary schools, they have uh, a great, they have eight, of the four by fours. And so one semester, like second grade goes out and does the planting. So each class gets to go out and plant one of the beds. And then the next semester, third grade gets to go out and do the plantings. And then in the, in, in the interim, uh, the science teacher takes other classes out there to learn from that garden space. So there's ways to incorporate it where you don't necessarily have to um, have a, a whole farm. Um, especially if your space doesn't allow for it or if you don't have enough support from, um, from staff or parents to help maintain the space. Um, you can just kind of stagger it out. And you heard from the teachers earlier how they allocate some of their plots. Um, you know, some of it might be for after, if you do expand out and you have a reason that you're, that you're doing that to help incorporate more of the students, 
You could have like an after school group um, helping. You could have certain grade levels where it ties to the curriculum really well. And then you could also um, allocate plots because sometimes you have a teacher that expresses interest and they just want, uh, you know, one of the beds to work with their kids. Um, yeah, so for CEUs, um, what I'm going to be doing is reaching out to the folks that registered through Eventbrite um, and provide you with like a survey and you can mark what you attended. And then I can um, correspond that to our Zoom sessions um, to, to see if I have all the times matching. Um, and then I can uh, send you a certificate for the tenants. And then you would um, submit that to um, your, your district or um, wherever you're applying for for the CEUs. So um, if you're looking to start out um, and you don't want to disturb the soil and you're not really sure what the interest is and where it needs to be, again, earth, the self-watering containers are really great, especially for the flexibility. And they work really well for some of the younger kids. Um, and then we talked about the rotating of the classes. And I would say if you have a really, if you have a small space and so not every kid is getting a chance to get their hands as dirty as you'd like them to, the more you can have them involved in all the prep work and the planning of where you're gonna put your plants and what you're going to grow and all of those different states, how to prepare the soil, all of that, the more involved they are in those different steps, the more opportunity they have to engage even if the space is small. Um, and then there, there is one school where, um, you know, funnies, so they would incorporate, they would ask all the, all the teachers to walk the kids by the garden on purpose, just to try to like, you know, make it stink like people in the hopes that maybe some of the bunnies wouldn't come to visit. Um, I don't know if that was effective, um, but I'm sure the kids enjoyed the walk. So other resources when you're trying to learn about things like square foot gardening, and when you hear me talk about there's nothing wrong with row planting, but a lot of times it's not suitable for the type of space that we're working in. Um, though sometimes when we're direct seeding, I do have a tendency to still try to put them in a row. Um, so with, uh, with, and I have seen it in a lot of the community gardens, even within their own plot, a lot of the members like to implement uh, square foot gardening techniques and create little paths within their own plot. So um, you have uh, access to a lot of free resources. Florida Ag in the Classroom, this is just one of their sample lessons that talks about square foot gardening. So say it's miserably hot in August when school starts, um, but you want to um, get the kids excited about you know, having a, a garden you can have them engage in activities where they start um, discussing what it is they'd like to plant. Um, so using a larger space, we kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but if you're gonna use a larger space, if you're not fully utilizing it and, um, and either you don't have the edible plants, the funds for the edible plants, and you just either need something to take up some space. Um, so you can do a, a few things. You can either leave it uncovered um, and just keep it weeded and let kids dig around in it and look for bugs and have a good time. Um, you can um, plant for pollinators. Um, the main thing I, I wouldn't, if you're ever gonna put it back in rotation, I just wouldn't put shrubs and trees, things that are hard to move and have root encroachment and things of that nature. Um, and I mentioned in an earlier session, flowers, um, are a very nice distraction. So say that some of your beds are in, are in flux where maybe they don't look the best, maybe your veggies aren't in production yet. Um, and when you have um, some things that make pollinators happy, but are also pleasing to the adults as they pass by, sometimes they don't notice if you have uh, some weeds. So we talked about like assigning uh, beds, after, you know, potential like after school activities, um, that type of thing. Um, incorporating your subject matter um, as much as you can, just offering and helping other teachers connect the dots on ways they could use the garden as an outdoor classroom. It doesn't require that they go out and dig up everything that you planted. Um, there's, there's lots of ways they can use that space. Um, and you can also experiment in the space. Does mulching make a difference? You know, have some that are mulched, some that aren't mulched. Alter your watering habits. Um, you, in, have those different experiments, try different varieties of some of the plants and talk about like disease resistance and, um, and all those types of things, taste tests. Um, before expanding, um, consider, you know, costs. Do you need more storage? Um, are you looking to have more beds or would you actually prefer to have seating 
or some shade. Um, so then that way you can use, you're more comfortable when you're out in that space. Um, I think there was one school, they actually took out some of the raised beds they had. They went to the self-watering containers. Um, they put in a little bit of like a versatile shade, uh, like a, what do you call those things? Not a kite, sail, like a shade, like a shade sail. Um, and, they, and they've really enjoyed how they've altered that space. They think um, people are more comfortable using it regularly. Um, and then make sure you put the garden to bed for the summer. Um, if you don't, you'll come back to like really, really, really big, tall weeds. And when you go to pull those out, you lose a lot of your soil. Um, and soil's not free anymore for the most part. So. Um, if you can cover it, that might, and we have a video on putting your garden to bed that we can share as well. So people are really important. Um, we talked before about um, including administration. Um, and if you can find ways where you can show them that you're teaching standards um, and using it as an outdoor classroom, or that there's some therapeutic benefit, that it's helping your kids focus when they get back to the classroom, or you're helping connect those dots. So something you talked about in the classroom, now they have this physical thing that helps them um, connect those dots. Um, maybe it's character traits like teamwork. Uh, maybe some of those kiddos that um, you heard about earlier, maybe they don't sit well in the classroom, but out in the garden space, they may actually show leadership skills and be teaching some of their peers. Um, you can reach out for ex to extension. A lot of times we can do train the trainer type of activities. Um, and or try to connect you with a volunteer. And then, um, and we may have suggestions on how to connect some of the curriculum um, or uh, create more engagement. Um, sharing things like grant information, um, answer questions. Sometimes I get a bug uh, picture and if I can't look it up, I reach out to people like Wilma. Um, and then, um, so, and then make sure you're, communicating out what you are doing. So if um, that way, or even if it's to encourage other teachers to ask some of the kiddos, what did they learn in the garden today? Or did they get to go to the garden today? And what did they notice? Um, or, you know, a note to the parents in the backpack to ask about something like that. So the kids have an opportunity to share something about their day. Um, and you can have like a, a garden shower, like a baby shower, if you needed to try to get additional resources. Um, and if you didn't have grants available, um, but I do think it's, it is excellent. Not every school has a PTO that can do this, but sometimes if you do have that line item to help you with replenishment of things like uh, soil amendments, um, that way you don't have to ask every year. You can just kind of rely on, on that. So to, to recap and, and where we are um, twice a year, uh, we provide um, some plants and seeds. I don't do it throughout the year because we honestly, we just, we don't have like a greenhouse where we're propagating seedlings. Um, and so um, they're purchased through a grower and we split them up and set them up for the, for the schools. Um, we have the seed packets prepped. We have some of that material on how to um, go about planting everything. Um, and then if we have volunteers to, to offer for um, site assistance, we do that as well. Um, and then, let me see here. Oh, master gardeners, generally speaking, aren't intended for maintenance, um, but for guidance. Um, let's see here. Uh, five to six year olds. So um, Annie's working with um, younger kids at church two times a month. Um, they can't be caring for the plants every day. Oh, yeah, because it's two times a month. Um, you, yeah. So you could do things like self-watering containers. You could have activities where maybe you're sowing seeds and they take something home and it, and it grows or it doesn't. Um, there's in the Florida Ag in the classroom and also the growing classroom out of Life Lab, there's a lot of activities where it starts to introduce kids to like observation and uh, nature and, and a little bit of gardening, but it's not intensive. Hey, you have a garden and now you need to take care of it to use this curriculum. Um, they do run the gamut. And so I'm going to show you, um, let me see here if I have that. So um, so this is, you're seeing Florida Ag in the classroom and then the drop down for like teacher resources. So you can see over here, they have awards and grants that they do um, in different kinds. 
And then if they're having any trainings uh, coming up, and then the teaching resources. And a lot of these, um, I don't know if you have to be like with a public school, but a lot of times if you reach out to them and ask them to mail you, or like if you're a, I need a hard copy kind of a person, um, and I know sometimes I can default to that. So sometimes they'll send you a, a hard copy or you can request um, like a flash drive, but you can download the whole entire thing as a PDF. And the convenience of that is then you have a find you're able to just hit find, you know, if you're looking for something specific um, and you don't have to flip through the whole book. So, um, so you could clip, go through here, gardening for grades, gardening for nutrition. And these actually have standards listed in the books. So if somebody sees a lesson and they're like, oh, I have those materials or this looks like something we could do. And it'll usually have those codes for how they tie to the state standards. Um, I'm not sure if Florida is revisiting some of the standards that they currently have, but I don't think they're going to be so drastically different that some of it still wouldn't correlate. Um, and then the stemming up gardening is one of their newest ones. And then there's make and take. So even if you just want to look through for some lessons, so like spice it up, you get, you talk about herbs, poetry in a bag. Um, you're talking about like writing adjectives and things like that. There's actually quite a few that don't rely on you having a physical space to garden because they do understand that sometimes that's not that's not in the cards for everybody. Um, I do think self-watering containers are really helpful. Sometimes you might need to still water a little bit at the top before it has the roots to, to wick down. Um, but you like main thing is you're gonna need to tap into somebody that's there somewhat regularly. Either you're gonna have to go back and, and check on plants, whether it's in a self-watering container or, um, or the garden space, um, or, uh, you know, have someone at the site um, that's willing to do that. Because um, you can you can put in like water systems on schedules and everything else, but if you're only going out two times a month, if, if that water system doesn't work, you know, all your plants could die before you notice it. Um, or you could have like, you know, bug infestation or something. Oh, like you could do is you could build a self-watering system, see how they, that you can build like this and it's something that they could take home. So, um, and that way they're still learning the concept. Um, you're reusing plastic materials um, before they go out um, for recycling. Um, and so that's an activity that you can do as well. So there's a lot of them on the Florida Ag in the Classroom uh, site. There's also National Ag in the Classroom. And then, um, let's see here, go back to here. So there's national ag in the classroom. And if you can, if you on your screen, I don't care if you see my face, um, you're welcome to start looking up any of these. I encourage you to start, you know, clicking through because um, sometimes you go to one site and it leads you to a, another lesson that leads you to another site. And then you find one that you're like, wow, where is this then? This is awesome. So one of the teachers earlier, Mrs. Kemble had mentioned she really enjoys kids gardening. Um, that's a very um, useful site as well. Um, there's also Life Lab. Um, they have a lot of, um, let's see here. They have a book called The Growing Classroom. There's a lot of uh, lessons there that take very little um, materials. Um, sometimes it might just be rocks that you find. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's engaging. And they have a really great one about, um, like seeds and how seeds uh, like have evolved to to make it make it so that they continue on. So like, how are seeds carried? Like, is it water? Is it wind? Um, it's a really I did it as a group with adults um, when I was at an event. It was awesome. Um, so the kids would really enjoy it. I had a fun time participating in that one. Um, so this is like Life Lab. There's a lot of lessons and activities that are on here for free. Um, and a lot of them have, are great for orienting the kids to like observing and getting their feet wet. Um, yes. And Deb Walker, you're right. National Ag in the Classroom. So if you're talking about trying to skin, go, get into, so play with Life Lab and they have videos as well, um, that you can watch. So if you're, if I like to see a video sometimes to see if like, can I do this? You know, same thing for cooking. Um, and so, um, so play on here. And then I'm going to go to the National Ag in the Classroom in a second. Um, trash, beautiful, garden, beginners, yes. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yes, I will send you a resource pages. So if, 
if you can and you have interest and you want to open up another browser, um, if you look up National Ag in the Classroom, um, which is agclassroom.org, I'm going to pull that one up now. And if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And then also I can just unmute everyone. Um, let's see here, because we're... Okay. So if you do have a question, because um, I can't read both screens at the same time, if you wanna. And if you have suggestion too, um, Deb, I know you're out here, if you have um, suggestion. Um, and I have your SMAP science uh, page on here. And then, did you do? Yes, um, Karen's got, um, yes, the family nutrition program's great. Yes, and salsa. Um, and let's see here. So this is some of the sites if you want to, to look those up. I'll leave that up on the screen for a second. Um, and I will come over to another screen and pull up. So this is the national ag in the classroom. And you can kind of see as you scroll through many resources um, and e-learning resources. And then the matrix, talk about the curriculum matrix and agricultural literacy. So if you go into here, then you see the e-learning and the, oh, I stopped my share, didn't I? Oh, you can see it, okay. Um, so if you're in the curriculum matrix, you can browse or you can try to search something specific. So um, if you just hit search all, there's 447 lesson plans. So um, between this and like Florida Ag in the Classroom and the Kids Gardening Site and Life Lab, there's so many different lessons. Um, and I can help, like if there's something in particular you're looking to teach or a certain grade level, I can try to help pinpoint something. Um, but it can be as simple as like you heard earlier, like with weeds and measuring the weeds and competing to see who pulled the longest weed. Um, but you could also then collect that data. You could have kids build graphs. You could have them um, average things and learn about like median and mode. Um, you could do lots of different things and just have some of that as part of that introduction to that activity. And for a lot of kids, because it started with something they did with their hands, um, it kind of keeps them connected and they just orient to it better. They, it's something familiar, tangible. So um, this one has lots of information and lots of, so companion resources, 925. Um, so there's lots of different activities that you can go in here and explore with. So there's an edible plant game. And then you can have um, materials that you can download. And a lot of these are always going to give you like, what are the materials that you need to complete this? Um, so that is. So and then there's also edible schoolyard. And then one of the things we talked about earlier with composting, um, our state resource, if you scroll down to different food recovery options for in the school. Um, so like there's a food waste reduction toolkit and there's free lessons. Um, so you can talk, you can read about composting in schools, but then there's also um, additional lessons. And whenever you leave their website, they, you know, they prompt you to let you know that you did. Um, so you can see what's inside the kit. Um, oh, like, so say for example, like grown from garbage. So that would be an activity. Say you guys have green onions. Um, that's something that you can have the kiddos do and then they can take that home. You could have them, uh, you know, you, you can use the green onions, but you can have them plant, um, plant them and then take them home and regrow them. And then they can cut off of them a couple times. 
Um, so, and that, that works really well. So there's um, activities that you can do where they still get to grow and it's easy on your pocketbook um, and, um, and you don't need a full growing space for it. So let's see here. Um, yeah, so introducing them to butterflies. Um, and, and that's one of those things that kids love seeing living things. So if you're able to incorporate, you know, those experiences um, with pollinators and stuff, or even just take them on exploration out in the area where your school is. And then one of the things that I think I put in here, um, oh, so if you're looking for something with the, from extension, you, you wanna know if we have material on something like how to build a raised bed or how to grow um, strawberries or something. You can go into your search engine. Um, and type in any search engine of choice. Um, and then you can type, uh, so let's say, um, I wanna know how to grow um, a kale. Um, I would just type in IFAS and it pulls it up. All these different articles about growing kale um, with additional links or I can type in EDIS. Usually IFAS, you get more user-friendly introductory and then it links you to the deeper uh, information. If you type in EDIS, which goes deeper into the database, um, you get um, some of the more um, content heavy. Um, sure, prove me wrong on this one. All right. Um, but you can see all through here, there's uh, 4-H and youth development. Sometimes there's uh, links through that, like Junior Master Gardener. Then you know where to register through Eventbrite. There's lots of cool classes um, that you can participate in, especially if you're off for summertime, because a lot of them are in the daytime. And then um, the Learning in Florida's environment um, is a really great tool. And then this blog talks all about how, um, what some of the resources are from our office uh, when we're partnering with youth um, or other kinds of programming um, out in the community, especially in relation to science. So um, some of those you've experienced little snippets today. And then this, um, this one of our colleagues, um, she, uh, we won an award for partnering on um, this project. She did a really great job because she switched it to a virtual platform to support the teachers if they wanted to keep um, uh, providing that. Um, and there's interesting information on what they learn when they participate in that program. And this is a, a cool resource if you haven't used it. The Ed Explore SRQ. Um, sometimes people are looking for like field trip locations um, or other opportunities um, or speakers. Um, and then if we put in And I'll let you go in just a second. We're almost out of time. So if you guys, um, I'll, I'll stay if you have questions, but um, so learning in for his environment. Um, hopefully if you were in there earlier today, you would have seen a little bit of this, um, but it's pretty comprehensive. So there's this whole handbook. And it talks about what it is. Then it gives you all these different categories. So nutrient cycles is in there, um, sustainability, animals, plants, weather, um, and you have links to the videos and then what, what standards you're teaching to. Um, and then there's usually always like a pre and post test if you're looking to assess what your kids learned from it. Um, so, and you can see how the, so this benchmark, it's eighth grade, right? Um, and then meanwhile, down here, there's second grade if I'm reading some of the benchmarks correctly, but then it even goes into fifth grade. So some of this you can scale up and down depending on what you teach. So, um, oh, the flower power lesson was a great introduction to plant parts and reproduction flower power. Is that one that was in here? Flower power, is, and I wonder if that's the one that Pat taught um, or Marguerite. Um, so it would be in here, but I'm glad you, I'm glad you saw that Mrs. Kemble. 
Um, yeah. And then who do we contact to get involved in the program, new after school enrichment program? Um, if it's school garden, if it's garden related, email me um, or still email me if you're not sure who you're trying to reach and I can forward you. Um, if it's the life program, it's um, Dr. Clements um, and um, her contact information should be on here. Yeah, uh, kclements at scgov.net. And then I know some of, um, let's see here. So, oh, and see um, Carol did insect observation and life cycles. So if you're wanting to have a little bit more of like what Carol did earlier, but geared towards, um, towards youth, you can do that. So, um, I could just scroll through. And then, um, so I will be in touch if you register through Eventbrite, I'll be in touch um, so you can receive uh, some of the resources um, and complete a survey, um, but also to contact me back to, um, I will be looking at um, your Eventbrite registration, but also your um, time in Zoom. So if you don't show up, like if you just appeared as um, like iPad, I wouldn't know who you are to connect you. So um, if you see your name, uh, I don't, can people see the participant list? If you scroll through on the, um, the participants, if you can see how your name displays, um, if I can see your name, at least your first or last name, I can probably figure out who you are. But where it says owner, um, whoever that is, I don't know who you are. Um, so it would be harder for me to connect the dots um, to um, say that yes, you attended uh, the session. So if you're owner, please feel free to message me um, either as ev to everyone in the chat or privately or email me so I know who you are. Um, thank you everybody for attending. I appreciate it. Um, and a very special thank you to all the speakers, um, especially our teachers as they were very busy coming up on the end of the school year um, and found time to, to create presentations and have discussion with us. Um, and Wilma, uh, you're never allowed to retire um, ever, 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 ever. So just so you know. Um, so thank you so much. I really enjoyed the day and uh, spending some time with you. And thank you.